Welcome to the History Guy Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories of lesser-known historical events told by Lance Geiger, also known as the History Guy on YouTube. I'm Josh, your host, a writer for the channel and eldest son of the History Guy. We tell all kinds of stories about history, from the modern era to the ancient past, so you never know what we're going to talk about next. One thing you can be sure of, it is history that deserves to be remembered. We at the History Guy are also excited to announce a new way to interact with the team and the History Guy himself at Locals.com. Join the History Guy Guild for your one-stop location to chat with other history fans, get updates on the team, and more. You can join for free or pay as little as $5 a month to get access to live chats with the History Guy, looks behind the scenes, early access to ad-free videos, and more. Find us at historyguyguild.locals.com. We look forward to seeing you there. On today's episode, the History Guy tells the stories of two railway disasters. In the years before highways and jets, rail was the fastest form of transportation, and with so many trains running, some of those trips were bound to end in disaster. First is the story of Quinton's Hill, where a series of unfortunate events led to the deadliest train accident in British history. Then, the History Guy talks about circus trains, and a terrible accident, the deadliest circus train wreck in American history. Without further ado, let me introduce the History Guy. A number of technologies grew and matured during the Great War. Airplanes, submarines, radio, zeppelins, terrible technologies like shrapnel, artillery munitions, and poison gas. But one technology rose above the rest in the Great War. It has been called the first and only railway war. Railroads were so important to the prosecution of the Great War that the timing of the start of the First World War was based on the existing railway schedules. The German better control of their railway network was one of the reasons that they were able to more quickly deploy more troops and gain success in the early part of the war. And as the war went on, it was the ability to move masses of reinforcements by rail to any point of attack that turned the Great War into the bloody static war that it was. And rail was just as important on the home front. In the United Kingdom, for the first time in the UK's history, the railway networks were all brought under government control. And the extensive British railway network served the United Kingdom's war effort in immeasurable ways. But it also contributed to the worst rail disaster in the history of the British Isles. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The United Kingdom realized the importance of rail for war preparations even before the Great War started. In 1912, the Railway Executive Committee was formed to manage railways in Britain in the event of an emergency such as war. The REC was to act as an intermediary between the various British railway companies and the War Office. There was roughly twice as much track in the United Kingdom in 1912 as there is today, and routes and stations were under the control of different companies. While the railway companies already worked with the War Office, for example, moving troops for training and during maneuvers, it was quickly recognized that a much greater degree of coordination would be required if Britain were to go to war. Trains were the only real option to move soldiers and sailors, their equipment, weapons, horses, and vehicles. The need was even more acute as the huge amount of horses requisitioned in war would further limit ground freight movement. Britain understood that railways would be a central technology in the war that was already on the horizon. The railways established plans and timetables to move troops and equipment to ports of embarkation in case of war, and all that was coordinated by the REC, who kept the timetables and distributed them in something called the War Book. On August 4, 1914, when the United Kingdom officially declared war, the Railway Executive Committee officially took direct government control of 130 railways in the United Kingdom. The war caused a special problem for the British Railway Service as men left to serve in the war. Over 180,000 British railway workers enlisted. Many of those went to work on the rail that supported troops in France, part of the railway operating division of the Royal Engineer Corps. More than 20,000 of the British railway workers that went to war never made it home from the European battlefields. Famously, more women were hired to help make up for the shortage of railway workers at home. The number of women employed by the British railway companies went from about 13,000 at the start of the war to over 68,000. Production was turned to a number of specialized cars for use by the military. Although shortages meant that older and less safe carriages, often in a state of disrepair, were also pressed into service. 
Specially designed wagons were built to convey army and navy equipment and fuel. Specialized trains included hospital trains that could be a third of a mile long that transported more than one and a quarter million injured and sick troops to hospitals throughout the United Kingdom over the course of the war. And the Jellicoe Specials, trains named for Admiral of the Fleet John Jellicoe, that carried coal from southern Wales to the Royal Navy Fleet in the Orkney Islands. By the end of the war, more than a hundred Jellicoe Specials were running every week. But of course, the central role of the railways in the Great War was directly moving troops. Many army camps were provided with new branch lines and sidings, as were new munitions factories. At Richborough, Kent, a new port was built and included the world's first roll-on, roll-off rail ferry. In the first two weeks of the war, 1,408 special trains ran, taking troops to ports of embarkation for France. The scale was staggering. Over a period of three weeks in 1914, a troop train would arrive at the Southampton docks every 12 minutes during the course of a 14-hour day. By August 31st, 1914, just 27 days after entering the war, trains to Southampton had transported more than 118,000 army personnel, 37,000 horses, 314 artillery pieces, and 5,200 vehicles. And the trains would keep rolling, carrying men and equipment to the ports that would carry them to France or the far-flung battlefields of the Great War. In May of 1915, one of those units that was being transported was the 7th Battalion of the Royal Scots. Originally raised in 1633, the Royal Scots were, at the time of the Great War, the oldest and most senior infantry regiment of the line of the British Army. The Royal Scots Regiment expanded quickly during the Great War. The seven battalions of the so-called Territorial Force were mobilized, and seven more battalions of volunteers were raised under Kitchener's New Army Scheme. By the end of 1914, the regiment included 24 battalions, and 10 more were added in 1915. All told, the Royal Scots raised more than 100,000 troops during the Great War, almost half of which would end up as casualties, killed or wounded. The Territorial Force had been created in 1909 as a part-time volunteer force designed to augment British land forces as a unified auxiliary without resorting to conscription. At first, the territorial battalions, not well regarded by the regular army, were only used for home defense, freeing regular army battalions for foreign service. But as the demands for the war increased, the territorial forces were increasingly deployed to the front. One such unit was the 7th Battalion of the Royal Scots Guards. Mobilized in what was then the city of Leith in August of 1914, the 7th RS spent the first several months of the war manning coastal defenses around Edinburgh. But in April 1915, they were sent for additional training, meaning that they were going to be deployed to the front. They expected that they were going to be sent to France, but that was not the Army's plan. On the evening of May 21st, 1915, the battalion was mobilized and issued with ammunition, blankets and bedding, and to their surprise, sun helmets, the sure sign that France was not their destination. The men of the battalion were instead being sent to the Mediterranean, to the bloody conflict at the mouth of the Dardanelles, called the Gallipoli Campaign. Originally, the men of the 7th RS should have shipped out a day earlier on May 21st, but the troop ship that was intended to carry them had run aground in the Mercy River, and so the uh, battalion was mobilized a day later, and they left on the morning of May 22nd. The battalion was loaded onto two trains. The first train left at 4 a.m., and the second left two hours later. The second train, including about half the men of the 1,000-man battalion, included 21 wooden carriages, with men packed eight to a compartment. The Caledonian Railway was formed in 1845, at a period when local railway concerns in the United Kingdom were developing into longer lines between cities and broader networks. The idea of the line was to connect local Scottish lines with the incipient English networks that were forming. The main line of the railway connected Glasgow to Carlisle using the 4 foot 8 and a half inch standard gauge, and when it was completed in 1848, it was the first continuous railway route between Glasgow and London. There were competing lines connecting Scottish cities to the English network, but the Caledonian line was a popular railway. The town of Gretna was just on the Scottish side of the Anglo-Scottish border. About a mile north of Gretna Junction on the Caledonian main line was the Quinton's Hill signal box. Quinton's Hill wasn't a town. The spot had probably been named for a house that was nearby in the 1850s, but by 1915 the house was gone. What Quinton's Hill was, was a place where there were two passing loops, one on either side of the northbound and southbound tracks of the Caledonian main line. Passing loops are short sections of track connected to the main track that allow trains to pass each other. On the morning of May 22nd, two northbound overnight sleeping car expresses were running late, so the local service from Carlisle had to be sidelined to allow the sleepers to pass. 
but a goods train was occupying the loop on the northbound track, and so the local was shunted onto the southbound track. A special freight train of empty coal wagons was coming southbound and was placed on the southbound loop. The first of the sleeper cars passed by northbound. The signalmen were making a shift change, the morning signalman, James Tinsley, having arrived late on the local that was now parked on the southbound track. He and the night signalman, George Meekin, were chatting in the signal box. The second troop train, carrying the men of the Royal Scots, was headed southbound. It's still not completely clear why the accident occurred. There were several breaches of regulations involved, but it appears that Tinsley and Meekin simply were distracted. As the troop train came, they signaled it through, apparently having forgotten that the local was still parked on the southbound track. The train full of sleeping soldiers was traveling at some 80 miles an hour when it struck the park local train at approximately 6.49 a.m. The collision was so hard that the leading carriages of the troop train hopped right over the locomotive of the local. The rest of the train compressed, spilling over onto the northbound tracks. Some 215 yards of train were compressed into less than 70 yards of space. Fire started almost immediately. The cars were lighted by gas lamps, and the canisters of gas under the wooden train carriages had ruptured and were ignited by the coals from the train's tinderbox. Soldiers were thrown, crushed, trapped, trying desperately to escape the burning wreckage. But less than 30 seconds later, a whistle started blowing. The second northbound sleeper was desperately trying to stop, but there was not enough time. It struck the wreckage at nearly 50 miles per hour. Many of the men who had managed to escape the initial collision were mowed down. A survivor, Peter Stoddard of Leith, was interviewed in 1985. He said, I think I prayed. The express hit us and I lost consciousness as I was thrown into the air. I came to halfway down an embankment by the track. The survivors, as well as nearby farm workers and villagers, alerted by the noise, came and started to pull men from the wreckage. Some men had to have limbs amputated on site to get them free. There is a persistent rumor that some men who were trapped were shot to keep them from being burned to death. Stoddard says he saw it happen. Rachel Nimmo, 28 years old, and her one-year-old son Dixon, traveling from Newcastle, were the only passengers on the local train killed. Seven died on the express, including a 43-year-old Scottish engineer and three army and two naval officers. The driver and fireman of the troop train and a sleeping car attendant on the express train also died. That was horrible enough, but the mass of the casualties were among the men of the Royal Scots. The official death toll listed by the army was 210, with another 224 injured. Only 83 of the Royal Scots dead could be identified. Of the 499 officers and men on the train, only 58 men and 7 officers were present for roll call that afternoon. The accident was devastating for the town of Leith, where it was said that there was not a family in the town untouched by the tragedy. The Quintons Hill train disaster is still today the worst rail disaster in British history. Tinsley, Meekin, and a man named George Hutchinson, who was the fireman on the local train, were charged in both Scotland, where the accident occurred, and England, where many of the victims died. They became the first men to be indicted for the same crime in two different United Kingdom countries, although they were tried in Scotland. Hutchinson was found not guilty, but Tinsley and Meekin were convicted of culpable homicide. They served a little over a year and were released in December of 1916, where they were immediately re-employed by the Caledonian Railway. That fact was part of the reason that the British Broadcasting Corporation, in a 2015 reanalysis of the accident, postulated that they might have conspired with the Caledonian Railway and the British government, who was technically in charge of the line, to take sole responsibility for the accident, and thus exonerating the people that were running the railway. They faulted the railway operators for knowingly ignoring violations of regulations, for overburdening their signalmen by trying to keep peacetime service running despite the increased demands of the war in order to preserve profits, and for negligently endangering the soldiers by putting them in wooden railway cars that they knew to be less safe. The bodies of 101 men of the Royal Scots were buried together in a mass grave in Edinburgh's Rosebank Cemetery. The funeral procession was lined by more than 3,000 soldiers and thousands of citizens. A memorial to the dead troops was erected in the cemetery in 1916.
Now's the part of the episode where we get to chat with the history guy. A little bit about what we just heard, what we're going to hear, and some behind-the-scenes stuff you only get to hear about on the podcast. It is interesting that, despite its importance, I think that railways are often overlooked these days, and I, I think that's true in both in historic discussion, a lot of historic discussions, and, uh, you know, in how important they are today. I, I, I've heard World War One be called, like, you know, the first modern war. And I think maybe nothing better exemplifies that than railroads. In what ways, and you talk about them a little bit in this, that do they literally alter what war was like from, you know, those 19th century wars? Yeah, you know, at the beginning of the episode, I talked something about rail in the uh, in the First World War. And th there's some people who argued with me because I, I, I say, I quote actually a historian who says that they thought that the that was the first railway war. The First World War was the first railway war. And some people say, no, the U.S. Civil War. Or certainly there was a lot of rail use that was, for example, in the, in the Second Boer War uh, and uh, the Franco-Prussian War. I mean, this was by no means the first war where was used but uh, this this really was the first war where rail was so uh, so much a method of moving everything uh, that it affected really every part of the war I mean certainly we use rails uh, in the Civil War but I mean, we didn't move everything by rail. Yeah. Do, so when you talk about the statistics that are kind of in the front end of this episode talking about how many trains were I mean a train arriving every 14 minutes 14 hours a day for months on end Crazy. Uh, and the you know the way that you're using these extensive railway networks where you got the coal trains going north to to the the fleet at Scapa Flow at the same time that you have all these troop trains I mean, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. And I mean, to every, I mean, e even across the pond in the United States, certainly on the continent. A matter of fact, they took railway workers who, who had worked on the railways in England, and they would go and build small railways behind the lines so that even if you had moved into no man's land where there was no rail, they were immediately building rail up behind it because it was that important to move stuff by rail. So, I mean, really, that you know, the biggest impact was, I mean, it wasn't the armored trains and things like that. The biggest impact was the sheer logistics of moving millions of men and millions of, of pounds of equipment. I mean, we talk, I think in another episode, I talked about the, the, the taxi cabs of the Marne, which is a famous story. Yeah. But actually, the taxi cabs moved a very small number of troops compared to what rail was moving in the same battle, the Battle of the Marne. So, so really what it is, it changed the scale. I mean, it just upped the scale of warfare. And that's one of the reasons when they, when they call the First World War the first world, it clearly wasn't the first time we fought a war around the world. But I mean, the scale of the, the world wars of the 20th century was just so much larger. Uh, you know, it was just exponentially larger. Well, that was, that was because of rail. That's what rail allowed us to do and on all fronts uh it, you know maybe less on the italian front where they were literally fighting on the top of mountains and stuff like that but on the rest of the fronts of that war i mean it, it's extraordinary that you know the number of troops so that even if you did manufacture i mean they did have these huge offensives planned and even if you did manufacture a breakthrough that the enemy could reinforce so quickly because of rail that your breakthrough, that's why they, they would fight and fight and they'd gain, you know, a couple miles of territory and then they'd be stuck yeah. again. So you could uh, you, you could move so many troops to any point of breakthrough. And that's one of the reasons that it was this big static war in the West. So uh, rail really defined, I mean, people think of artillery defining it or gas defining it or whatever. Rail really defined the First World War. The whole thing about this massive static trench war was really because rail let you put those troops where, you know, where the fight was and and that meant that it was always this just gory bloody nasty stalemate of of, of death and dismemberment uh, and, and so it is it, it it massively changed war and you could see that even if you're in rural england when they the way that they were moving troops and you can also yeah. see england a country running their economy running on rails trying to run the war on rails at the same time you know it's kind of surprising you didn't have more examples of what happened at quinton sale it's uh, to some extent you could even argue a little bit that uh, World War One was unique in its use of rail because by World War Two we also had other means of moving yeah. things and uh, yeah. rail was important then too but I, we had a lot more I, you know there yeah. weren't tanks Mo the motor vehicles were, were so completely different in the Second World War than they yeah. were in the First World War I mean there's a lot of motor vehicles in the in the in the First World War it's interesting how they were used but I mean they those models are, are move at a completely different rate yeah so you you didn't have really the idea of mechanized infantry and things like that in the in the in the second world war and that's one of the reasons that it didn't end up as the the static trench war that the first world war did i mean that's uh, you know rail meant that if as long as you had a railway it was very hard to break through uh and and uh, when you got mobility that meant that, that you know that that you could move faster than you could possibly build rail so the second world yeah. war is different than the first world war largely because the technology of transportation transformed so significantly and it didn't get bogged down. It is certainly in the Civil War, too. I mean, there was a lot. We used railway a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and specifically destroyed lots of railway in the yeah, south we did. because we knew it was how a huge advantage that the north had more rail and therefore a better ability yeah. to move things and one of the most significant impacts of course on rail of the of the civil war was that because the south wasn't in the senate that allowed them to select the transcontinental railway line instead yeah. of going the southern route the central line and and the gauge of the transcontinental line and that that transformed rail throughout the nation uh, but i mean rail was clearly important to the civil war and you know the first uh, the first guys that were awarded the medal of honor was because they went to the south and stole a train uh, and uh, it, so it clearly was important to it, but y you didn't move the, the, the Army of the Potomac largely by rail. You didn't move, uh, I mean, you moved, it, rail could be important to supplying armies and stuff like that, but I mean, it, it was not at all like the First World War where, where literally the whole war was defined by whether you could get there on a train. Because there was, I mean, we, I know we did move troops by train, but for one, we didn't have anywhere near the scale of railroads that they had. No. no. And uh, we didn't, you know, you know, when we talk about the large armies, uh, nobody, nobody was moving the whole army by train. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they marched. Uh, I mean, so, so that we, the, I mean, we could move, but I mean, it wasn't like if, if, uh, uh, it wasn't like we could quickly respond to Gettysburg because we had a rail yeah. line that meant that we could have the troops there very quickly. It was still, I mean, that meant maneuver was very important. And there were times in the Civil War where, you know, when an army was moving and we, and, you know, the other side could not move troops to get there quickly enough. And so, I mean, there's, it was, it was different. But I mean, it's, I certainly didn't mean when I said that when I started by the start, yeah. it's not to say that rail, that this is the first war in which rail was important because that's obviously not true. But I mean, the, the scale of, of rail and it, just talking about that in terms of, I mean, Quentin Sills not even talking about at the battlefield, just talking about no. if, if every place that was part of the war, the trains were running all the time full of troops. And that's, I mean, that's really what defined the war. And when we start talking about, you know, the specific, the specific tragedy, it is, as with so many of the stories that we tell, there's such an element of chance. Yeah. And I guess that's true of anything. If any event is going to become a disaster, when you start looking at yeah. what happened before it, I mean, everything led up to that point, and those there were circumstances. But it is, it, it leaves me wondering. You know, if they had left a day earlier, yeah. like they were supposed to, yeah. except for the boat, they were delayed one day, and then on that day, the the the, uh, the express was late. And, uh, and, yeah. and they had an extra train and that was really how it all happened. And yeah, I mean, there's also those stories. There's all, you know, there's lots of people who like, I had a ticket for the Titanic. I didn't get on board. I was going to be on that airplane yeah. and I didn't make it on. Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of those sorts of stories. Chance always plays a role. So, I mean, what you could maybe say is that with the way that they were running rail in the United Kingdom, uh, it's not a shock that eventually you had a, a train full of troops have a terrible collision. Uh, because they were running so many of them so fast all the time, you know. But uh, yeah, these guys, it was and all coming from one town, and and I mean, it was it's, it's just a horrible, tragic tale. And you're right. I mean, they were if they hadn't been delayed by that one day, uh, well, then they you know they would have gone to Gallipoli. So I don't know if they really were going to come out all that much better. <laughs> That's but, true. Uh, you, you hear where they were going, and you're like, oh, yeah, well, that was, <laughs> you know, this uh, you hear, disaster too, here so. or there. Uh, but, uh, you know, which, you know, which, which unmarked grave you're buried in. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, there is just a lot of chance that happened on this. Uh, the chance that the, that the two railway guys were talking and apparently distracted. The chance that the one railway guy was taking the morning train. And because that was delayed, uh, then he was there late. And otherwise, he would have known that the other train was on there. And, the, and you know, they, they were tra supposed to travel that day. They were supposed to travel the day before. And it was just because of their troop ship. And it's all just... You know, it all goes together because it was in this instant, just yeah. in, in, well, kind of two instants because there were really two train wrecks in it. But uh, it's in that, that very brief window of time that this all happens. Uh, and, you know, what put them there at that very brief window of time? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a horrible story. It, it's hard to tell the stuff sometimes from history. But, I mean, these, you know, these, these, uh, these soldiers and, I mean, even the, you know, the, the, on, the, on the overnight that got hit, I mean, the, you know, the two deaths were a young mother and her, and her young yeah. child. And they, they deserve to be remembered. And it's it's difficult. Uh, I mean, it's always difficult to tell them because these these are real human stories. And I think that uh, to some extent we kind of forget, you know, just that these were people just like us. Uh, you see them because once once they're you know once they're hundred years in the past, it's it's easy to just kind of see them as words on a page or you know, black and white photographs. Uh, but it's I I like that when we tell them that and is too I, part of the point is to remember these people. So as, as, as you explain how this accident occurred, it really kind of only emphasizes just how complex it was to manage a railway. Because yep. unlike, you know, uh, roads that you could do with cars, you know, they've got more space they can pull off. You can only pull a train 
in certain yeah. directions in certain yep. places. Gotta go where there the track is. There can only be so yeah. many trains. Yeah, because it's it's limited to that track. So mm -hmm. a, as you had mentioned, perhaps the real surprise is that there weren't more serious disasters like this. I mean, there were train accidents all the time in the yeah. era of trains, and that was that was a matter. It wasn't that train was so much more dangerous. It was just that because that's how much we were moving by then. There's automobile yeah. accidents a lot today, uh, but uh, it is surprising that that wasn't more of the story. I mean, we were just talking about how important the railway was to moving everything during the war. It's, it's kind of surprising that there weren't more train accidents as a result of that. And, you know, you can talk also about, say, German precision. I mean, they talk a lot about that. But, I mean, the German rails made a big difference, and they were very, very precise on the, how they moved rails uh, because you had to be. when you're, when you're, you're yeah. If you want to move 100,000 troops, uh, plus you want to fuel the fleet, and they're on opposite yeah. ends of your island. You know, the coal's being dug in Wales, and it's being sent to Scotland, and the troops are being raised in Scotland. And they're being sent, being sent you know, to, to, to Wales, right, to, to, in order yeah. to, to, to ship. You know, then, you know, that's a lot of trains going. And, and, and they're all using the same tracks. And they're all using I mean, the, same, the same track. I mean, they had a lot of tracks in England, but they are. Yeah, true. But, I mean, they say, I mean, the whole point there, Quintins Hill wasn't even really a place. It wasn't a town or anything. It was just a spot. But it was where they had two side rails where you could pull a train off. And, you know, it happened to be a day where they needed three. Uh, and uh, yeah. that's, but I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, I can't imagine managing the railway schedules the way they had to manage the railway schedules during the war. So you can talk about government malfeasance or whatever in, in, in this accident. I mean, certainly, you know, silly things happen that should not have happened to, to cause this accident. Yeah. But given uh, the, the number of opportunities to screw up uh, with all that was going on, it's, it really is surprising. It didn't happen more often. Yeah. And they and I mean, I understand, too, you know, they talk about they were using the wooden trains, which were uh, more dangerous because they could catch fire. But I also understand, I mean, when you're in desperate need of moving soldiers uh, and supplies, you use what trains you got. I yeah. mean, it's one of those. Uh, there, well, certainly there were a lot. And of they kept trains. all the commercial rails going or try to keep the commercial rail going to, yeah. to keep paying for the railway lines. And, and uh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, you know, all you're doing is you're rapidly increasing the traffic on the same system. And so that yeah. means that your equipment wears and, and your people become exhausted. Uh, and uh, that, you know, that's going to show at some point. And, yeah, you had mentioned that so many of the, you know, the people working the lines had ended up going to war. Yeah. That they, I mean, that, that, that's a problem, too, because yeah. a lot of their... Yeah, know, their... a lot of your most experienced people are pulled off the line and are, are being sent yeah. off to war. So at the, at the same time that you were... So, I mean, th through much of history, though, I mean, since we've had rail, you know, if you're working on the railway line, they don't want to draft you. They don't want you in service. Well, that's the whole point of the, the movie The General, right? Is that he, they won't let him sign up for the Confederacy because he's, because he, he's a train engineer and, and you know, his whole, his whole family thinks he's a coward. Yeah, and uh, so, I mean, yes, but uh, in England, they, they literally started recruiting because they were building rail on the front. And you just you can't mobilize the way they did without taking it out of that, and, yeah. it, and that moved a lot of women into the rail system and stuff like that. And but I mean, it does mean yeah that you've got people, you got people who might have retired, you got people who have less experience, uh, and you have people working longer hours and they're more tired. And I mean, all that's going to happen. I mean, you, the increase in all the activity is simply going to make it more likely that something bad can happen. I mean, that's just how it works. And you do mention at the end uh, this idea of there being a possible conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And while I, it doesn't sound like we have any definitive evidence, and I, I guess personally I wouldn't be willing to say for sure that I believed it, it does make some sense that perhaps Tensley, Tensley and Meekin, who are the two that ended up going to jail for just a year after this disaster, that they and then they got rehired by the same rail line. Yeah. Uh, there is some sense there to say that they were like, ah, we're putting the blame on you because yeah. there were, th there were we things that went wrong. Because we got to put the blame on somebody because it was horrible. Uh, yeah, I mean that actually that conclusion was actually made by the BBC, and when they did yeah. an analysis after, and I, you know, there's good reason to say that that it sure sounds like there was some sort of deal behind the scenes that said we can't indict the whole system because we can't change the whole system. Yeah, uh, and well, so, they still needed so, you know, it. Yeah, so you guys are, you know, you two will you'll be in jail for one year, and then you'll come out and you get your jobs back, and in exchange you're taking all the weight of this. Sure seems like that's what happened. I mean, that's, you, you yeah. talk about conspiracies, but I mean it, that there, there's a reason to say, wow, that does sound kind of like what the story was. It's awfully hard to explain. Uh, if they were really being held responsible for the horror of that accident, uh, that they yeah. would only spend a year in jail and then they'd hire them back on the railroad. Yeah, yeah, and the same. Yeah, the exact, same yeah, railroad, it's, yeah. It's pretty, pretty, pretty unbelievable. But on the other hand, I can see where they're like, well, they're, you know, structural systemic changes within the, within the trains, uh, the whole train system that really could have made this less significant. Yeah. Unfortunately, but, I mean, if you blame the railroad or if you blame the government who was running the railroads at the time, yeah. uh, then you could significantly impact the ability to move stuff by railroad.
and you had to and get you had to get coal from Wales to uh, Scotland to fuel the fleet, and you had to get people from Scotland to Wales to fuel the army, and yeah. you know, no no one was willing to do that. Yeah, and this episode also, and you've done this on on numerous episodes where we've got where we've got these kinds of lists. Uh, it's it's especially moving because you you list the names of the mm -hmm. the folks who have died. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we can't quite uh, yeah we can't replicate the that same on, effect on the, on the podcast. podcast. Yeah, you wouldn't want to but, read them all. And I was I mean yeah. I I want to show respect. Uh, I show those usually when I have the full list. Sometimes I yeah. don't um, um, because I just don't have the right list and I don't want it to to be incorrect. Uh, but yeah. uh, uh, you know, I, I, whenever I do, I always feel like oh it's going too fast or I mean it's it's it, I mean it's tough. Uh, what I can say is I very much want to. Uh, part of the point of doing this is because I'm talking about people that I think deserve to be remembered, and I very much want to be respectful to them. Uh, and that's why I put the list of names there. Uh, I know that's, you know, those are, it's been a long time. I don't know how many people still are going to be looking for a name of someone that, that, that died in, the, in that wreck, but those names, uh, they deserve to be remembered. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, uh, and I, I try, I really do. I try to put silence at the end. I try to sometimes put a, a quotation at the end or something that, that just really makes it clear that this is, uh, one of the reasons that we talk about history uh, is because uh, you know these events and these lives mattered, and the passing yeah. of time shouldn't make them not matter anymore. It's so easy for us to you know be like, ah, oh, this is the deadliest railway disaster, mm -hmm. and to talk about it as the you know the Quintons Hill railway disaster. Uh, but I I think I I really like the idea of playing those names, reading them, and uh, recognizing them for a minute because you know those were those were people who who. It was the real human cost of that disaster, and I really think that it's uh, it's not much, but it's something to be able to to read their names and to remember to remember them, even mm -hmm. if we didn't you know we didn't know them and we don't necessarily know that much about them. At least we can remember their names. At least uh, uh, we can acknowledge that these were people and not just a number. Yeah. You know? Magellan TV is sponsoring this episode, and they sponsor all of our podcasts. And if you've listened to the podcast, you know that what we like to do is talk about what we've been watching on Magellan TV lately. And so what have you been watching on Magellan TV? Yeah, you know, I was just, gosh, there's so much. <laughs> you pick there. Uh, but I was watching one called King Arthur the Legend. Uh, and the reason I picked it up is because we, we, we like to take, you know, fairly popular myths that people have heard and then talk about, you know, what's really unknown about them. I mean, we've done that for several, from the, the Lone Ranger to Lady Godiva to Blackbeard. Uh, and so that really looked interesting to me because it looked like the type of topic that the history guy would do. Uh, and uh, there's so much that you can watch on, on Magellan TV. So this is, it, it talks about the legend of King Arthur, and then it talks about what the real Romani British king would have been like. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things I particularly liked about it is that the, the locations that they're filming on are uh, in Wales, places that I've been. So places like Castle, Castle Cock and Caerleon and stuff like that. And so I really found that entertaining. Uh, because uh, because I've been to those places and you really feel like you know you, you feel like they're I talk about completely from a different period. I mean, Castle Cock was actually built in the 18th or the 19th century. It was actually, yeah. it was actually <laughs> built, built by a guy who had coal fortunes. But uh, uh, it, 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 you really kind of get the feel for the the realism of it when you when you've been there and you stood in there and you say, oh, you know, you feel like you're standing in history when you're there. So it's it's a lot of fun uh, and it gives you a lot more insight about uh, what really you know it would have been like. What you know, what 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 Arthur. Because uh, we don't know that Arthur was a historical figure at all. But, I mean, what the period that he comes from, you know, what it would have been like. And it really is very different than the legend. Yeah, I've always I've always thought that the, the, the Arthur legend is a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. I've read a lot of a lot of fictional books and stuff about it. That's a, uh, I think it's a really cool idea. And it was such a chaotic time period there in yeah. In Britain, so it's in I think the period of the Saxon invasions, and yeah, it, yeah. yeah, it's called King Arthur the Legend. Absolutely worth your time. A, a delight to watch. A lot of great reenactment in there. Yeah. What What have you been watching on Magellan TV? So I was watching this show called Mark of Empire, and it has this Singaporean researcher. Uh, his name is Peter Lee, and he is talking in this one. He t there's four episodes where he talks about various different Southeast Asian cultures. Uh, this one is it's called Ayutthaya. There we go, Ayutthaya. I'm sure I'm going to to butcher that. So, <laughs> uh, but it was it was this ancient. I guess not. It's not exactly ancient. It's more like late medieval ages and then into the early modern period. A kingdom that was in uh, Siam or kind of central southern Thailand today. He does does numerous things that were that this culture was known for. So he talks about he talks about the kingdom and the history of it and then he talks about like he goes and makes bricks for these were the bricks that they were using to uh, build their temples and he 
goes to a guy who trains elephants because they were known for having a war elephants. And it's kind of incredible that there's there's really, you know, those those pieces of the culture still exist there. Uh, he makes some he makes some food that was like specifically made for the royals. And so he does he does some really interesting like hands on stuff. You get to learn culturally about this this kingdom and how it has kind of impacted the modern Thailand. And then also, of course, he, he gives some narrative as to, you know, the actual history of this kingdom, which is some place that I'd never uh, particularly heard of. And it's called Mark of Empire, Asia's Ancient Civilizations. You always say if you if you like the history guy, you'll like Magellan TV. Yeah. And of course, if you are a listener or watcher of the history guy, you can always go to try.magellantv.com slash history guy where we will always have a deal for you, sometimes a free month or a deal on an annual membership or even a documentary that you can watch for free. Again, that's try.magellantv.com slash history guy. Next up, the history guy talks about the deadliest circus train wreck in American history. And stay tuned after the episode to hear us chat a little more with the history guy. American railways went through what could be called sort of a golden age between the 1870s and around the turn of the 20th century. Total American railway mileage increased from around 163,000 miles in 1890 to more than 193,000 miles by the turn of the century as railroads took in more than a billion dollars in annual revenues and employed more than three quarters of a million workers. And one of the results of the growth of American rail that you might not have thought of was the growth of American circuses who could use those rails to transport their equipment and animals and performers around the country to perform underneath the big top. But that combination of circuses and rails came tragically together in the early morning hours of June 22nd, 1918, outside the small town of Hammond, Indiana. The Hagenbeck Wallace Circus Train Accident of 1918 represents one of the most tragic forms of forgotten history because many of the victims of the accident could not be identified, literally lost to history, and yet the victims of the deadliest circus train accident in history deserve to be remembered. The modern idea of a circus is generally attributed to have been started by Englishman Philip Astley around 1768. A former cavalryman, Astley added a unique innovation to the pastime of trick riding, having the riders perform inside a 62-foot diameter circular stage, or ring. This allowed a better view for the audience and also allowed the riders to take advantage of centripetal force. Originally, Astley hosted outdoor performances, but he eventually built numerous indoor arenas in England, Ireland, and France, and included a number of different kinds of acts. Acrobats, jugglers, stage magicians, and clowns had performed for centuries, but Astley was the first one who put them into an integrated performance inside the ring. Scotsman and trick writer John Bill Ricketts brought the idea to the United States, giving the nation's first circus performance in 1793. Ricketts' circus was popular with at least one important American fan from the time, George Washington, who gave Ricketts his white horse named Jack that he had ridden during the Revolutionary War and which Ricketts exhibited as a sideshow. Circus owner J. Purdy Brown then revolutionized the traveling circus with the addition of a large canvas tent in 1825. This allowed traveling circuses to give more regular performances under the famous Big Top. Traveling circuses became one of the most popular forms of American entertainment in the 19th century and were in many ways the beginning of American pop culture. Clown Dan Rice was, in his time, the most famous person in the nation counting among his acquaintances Zachary Taylor, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and President Abraham Lincoln. Nearly forgotten today, Rice has been described by one biographer as the most famous man you never heard of. But circuses really found their footing when they went from moving a few miles a day in wagons to transportation by train. The first circus in America to travel by train was Den Stone Circus in 1854. But it was in 1872 that legendary showman P.T. Barnum and his associates developed methods to easily load circus wagons onto trains. And that revolutionized the industry and created the model for the American Railroad Circus. The combination of circuses and trains made sense. Trains were ubiquitous in the United States and excelled at hauling heavy cargo. Trains allowed circuses to be truly national shows. Quickly, Barnum realized that owning his own cars was more economical and safer than using the carrier's cars, and the circus-owned train became the norm. By the early 1890s, seven major circuses traveled by rail, ranging in size from 20 cars to the 65-car train of the Barnum & Bailey Circus in the United States. Among the many circuses traveling the country by rail at the turn of the century was the Great Wallace Show's Circus. Livery stable owner Benjamin Wallace opened the circus in 1884. 
It was a popular circus headquartered in Peru, Indiana, and was famous for a 1903 United States Supreme Court decision regarding its advertising posters that determined that advertising was covered by copyright. But the Wallace Circus suffered from several tragic accidents. On July 16, 1903, the brakes on a caboose failed while the circus train was unloading for a parade in Shelbyville, Illinois. Several cars from the train rolled down a hill and ran into some unloaded box cars. Then the cars were accidentally struck by an engine that had been racing to catch them. Twenty-five members of the circus were injured, with a worker named Leon Stone dying when broken ribs punctured his lung. In addition, several of the circus horses were injured, two of which had to be put down. Less than a month later, on August 7th, the Wallace Circus was coming in two trains to perform a show in Durand, Michigan. As the second train approached the first train, the engineer says that he applied the air brakes, but they failed to engage, and the two trains collided. The town sounded the fire whistle, and the entire town was summoned to help pull people from the wreckage. Thirty-five people were killed, and 121 people were injured, many seriously, and an elephant and two camels from the circus menagerie were also killed. To that date, it was the worst accident for a circus train in history. Travel by rail was not particularly dangerous per mile traveled, but trains, like any travel, included risks, and accidents could be horrible because of the weight of the trains and the high speeds that could be involved. Given the sheer breadth of American rail travel and miles traveled daily, accidents were frequent and deadly, and circuses traveled enough miles that they would inevitably be involved in accidents. For example, a 1901 accident where a train from Buffalo Bill's Wild West show collided with a freight train killed over a hundred horses used in the show. Famed trick shooter Annie Oakley was so severely injured in the accident that she retired from the show. These two train wrecks involving the Wallace Circus in 1903 were not by any means the first circus train wrecks in U.S. history. The first known fatal circus train wreck in U.S. history occurred all the way back in 1877. The website Circuses and Sideshows lists 56 known railway accidents in the United States involving circuses and carnivals in history. In 1907, the Wallace Circus had merged with another circus to become the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus. It was one of the most popular circuses in the country, considered the Midwestern version of Barnum's largely East Coast show. The circus was large, traveling with two trains of 35 cars each. On June 21, 1918, the circus performed two shows in Michigan City, Indiana, and then traveled overnight to the town of Hammond, 45 miles away. The first train arrived early, carrying mostly workers, ready to set up the big top for the next show and the circus's animals. The second train included sleeper cars, carrying the cast. These were older cars, made of wood. Early in the morning of the 22nd, the second train experienced a hot box, a common issue where an axle bearing overheats. The train pulled off to a side to fix the problem, as a hot box can cause a fire if not fixed. The train was long, so even on the siding, the last five cars, four of which were wooden sleeper cars full of circus performers and workers, were still on the main track. Red lights were placed on the back of the train, and stop signals set up the line to warn any incoming trains. Also on the main line was a train carrying 20 empty Pullman cars. It was a troop train that had delivered soldiers to Kalamazoo, Michigan, and was now empty, headed back to Chicago. The engineer, a man named Alonzo Sargent, was experienced, having worked for the Michigan Central Railroad for nearly 30 years. But that night he was tired, having not slept for nearly 24 hours. He was taking kidney pills, which could cause drowsiness, and he had shut the engine window due to wind. Lulled by the rocking of the train and the warm engine, he dozed off. He missed several stop signals. Reportedly, a circus worker had stood even farther down the rail. He waved his lantern frantically and finally threw it at the locomotive, which was going some 25 miles per hour. Newspaper reports from the time vary as to the speed of the train, when it collided with the circus train at 4 a.m. on June 22nd. But the troop train was pulling what was called at the time heavy stock, cars made of steel, and crashing into cars made of wood. The circus assistant lights manager, asleep in the last car before the caboose, said that he woke to the sound of splintering wood. The train buckled in on itself, and then the kerosene lamps, which hung in the hallways of the sleeper cars, set the wreckage ablaze. Nearly everyone on the train was injured or killed. Acrobat Eugene Enos found himself trapped beneath some wooden beams. His wife helped pull him free, right as the flames almost reached him. He was one of the lucky ones. Joe Coyle Jr., just two and a half years old and billed as the youngest clown in the United States, and his brother, Howard, 11 years old, members of a celebrated clowning family, died along with their mother. Joe Coyle, their father, survived. The Hammond and Gary Fire Departments came, but there was little water nearby. A crane pulled in to help move wreckage, but couldn't approach because the fire was so hot. 
survivors sobbed as they desperately searched for friends. Despite the efforts of the people of Hammond to help, in all, 86 people died and more than 100 were injured in the accident. It was the deadliest circus train accident in history. Most of the fatalities occurred in the first few moments of the crash. Some of those victims were the circus's top acts, literally some of the most famous people in the nation at the time, but others were nearly anonymous. Bodies burned beyond recognition, working in an industry where many workers were itinerant and might be known by nothing but a, a nickname. 53 of the deceased were buried in a single plot at Woodlawn Cemetery in Chicago, owned by the Showman's League, a fraternal order that had been created in 1913 to support men and women in show business. Of the 53, only five could be identified. Grave markers for the unidentified say things like unidentified female or nicknames like Smiley or Baldy. 48 souls who are forgotten history, except for those markers. That part of the cemetery today is called Showman's Rest. Accountability for the families of the victims was hard to come by. The engineer and fireman were criminally charged, but the jury deadlocked and nobody was convicted. The Interstate Commerce Commission report also criticized the use of wooden railway cars and kerosene lamps. Surprisingly, the circus, despite the magnitude of the tragedy, only missed two shows. Other circuses, in a spirit of camaraderie and following the adage that the show must go on, lent the circus equipment and acts, and the circus continued. The Hagenbeck Wallace Circus continued to play until it finally closed its doors in 1938, the victim of reduced ticket sales during the Great Depression. The circus's former headquarters in Peru, Indiana, now houses the International Circus Hall of Fame. The golden age of American railroads and American railroad circuses has long since passed. American railway mileage actually peaked around 1920, and while rails are still important today, they struggle to compete with all the new transportation technologies that are available. And eventually the same thing happened to America's circuses, which have seen dwindling ticket sales in an era when there are so many entertainment options competing for people's attention. The Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus, the greatest show on earth, performed its final performance May 21st of 2017 and closed its doors. The earliest version of that circus had gone all the way back to 1806. And yet the golden age of American Rail and American Railroad Circuses deserves to be remembered, as do the victims of the 1918 Hammond Circus train wreck, the deadliest circus train wreck in history. So in the last one, you know, we talked about railway used in warfare, and this kind of goes a slightly different direction, and it's a little, a little, a not kind of similar time timeline though. It's in this in this kind of golden age of rail, um, as important as railways were in Europe, you can see why in the United States railways were so important too. Mm -hmm. Before we had planes and cars that are driving eighty miles an hour in interstates. That was really the only way, except for by river, that you could you could move something mm -hmm. across the country. And it's easy to see why it became the huge business that it was here it when was, we had yeah. these railroad barons. I mean, the U.S. was kind of slow to come to rail. And you know, for a long yeah. time, we had to import our locomotives. from. We couldn't even build them here in the United States. And the first one we built had a race with a horse and lost. Uh, and uh, oh, the train broke down. That. But, uh, uh, but by the latter part of the 19th century, the United States was an undisputed, indisputably the world leader in rail. Uh, I've heard some claims that there was more rail in the United States than the rest of the world combined. I had some people argue with me about that. And I don't know anybody went out and measured all the rails, but I mean, certainly, I mean, uh, our rail system dwarfed England, even though England, you know, yeah. started out as that leader in rail. Uh, and it was because of that is yes, because that was the way that we had to move freight across vast distances. And, and I mean, it was, the, the, it was such a large country uh, and, uh, and uh, the rail ended up kind of poking into every little spot of that country. So rail was going yeah. everywhere and all the time. And uh, it was uh, incredibly important to the economy. Uh, and we were building huge amounts of rail. And then of course we were all having all these economic rail booms and busts and so we, we built we overbuilt rail because you could make a fortune off of it and then you'd lose fortune and the robber barons and it's really an interesting period how much rail defined really the latter part of the 19th century in the United States yeah, that that whole gilded age yeah. kind of period yeah. and it's it I think today, you know, it's it's maybe less in, less vital than it was at that time, but when we still use rail to move a lot of yeah. stuff, I think I think people would be surprised just how much moves Absolutely. by rail. Yeah. You, if you look at rail, I mean, certainly in terms of passenger rail, we look nothing like Europe. But if you talk about freight yeah. rail, um, generally you'll have people say that American freight rail is among the best in the world, and, and we still move yeah. an awful lot by rail. Yes. Yeah, we don't do as we do a lot less by passenger rail. Uh, although I have done several several 
train yeah, rides. I've um, written, I mean, you know, there's parts, there's parts of like in the Northeast Corridor that look a lot like Europe. Yeah. We use a lot of passenger rail, but uh, we don't uh, we don't use passenger rail like you know Japan or Europe. I mean, we certainly have those yeah. those complaints about our passenger rail. Part of that has to do with distance too, uh, and you know, there's talk about changing that. But either which way, we have an extensive uh, and impressive and very modern uh, system of freight rail in the United States, and you're surprised about how much of it you have that has moved at some point by yeah. by freight. Yeah. When when you were first doing this episode, one of the things that really kind of struck me is that it's it's a really unexpected kind of episode. Because mm -hmm. I think that even if you you know you talk about railways and understand how important they were in the nineteenth century, I it's easy to not think about moving circuses mm -hmm. via rail. And mm -hmm. I guess if you're not you know if you're not really thinking about the circuses that much, because it's all something that kind of makes sense once you start thinking about it. It's like mm -hmm. of course that'd be the, that'd be the best way. They could go almost anywhere. It's mm -hmm. going to move them more quickly than anything else, and you can put pretty much all your animals on there, yeah. and they'll they'll be okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, a circus train, I think, is fairly well known. I mean, you, you, no one thought that the carts that they take in the parade, they actually would yeah. take them as, you know, cross country, you know, you know <laughs> That's fair. with a horse <laughs> dragging them. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, but uh, this is this is an interesting episode. But actually, I kind of came to this episode because I was looking at another train wreck. Uh, and I was actually okay. looking at the train wreck that happened with the, the uh, Buffalo Bills Wild West show uh, and where Annie Oakley was injured. Uh, and yeah. uh, and I in in one of those it mentioned this wreck and I and I went and this is of course not not well known anymore. Uh, it was well known kind of at the time, still well known where it occurred. Still, you know, the, there's still the elephant in the in the cemetery in Chicago. But uh, but I mean, it's uh, it really is an interesting tragic tale uh, that I think just wasn't terribly well known. And and, uh, and it really does. It talks about the foibles of rail, but it also talks about. I mean, it was really kind of interesting to talk about how rail facilitated yeah. circuses yeah and and that those were such an important part of culture for a very long period of time you gotta you gotta wonder yeah. how many miles some of these elephants you know yeah, <laughs> were really traveling yeah. over the yeah it, you know cu culturally it's it's it, it's interesting to see that you know that was how that was how so many of these things traveled and you know the circus came to town on the trains and came off and then they'd get back on and it's it's really mm -hmm. kind of incredible and you had mentioned during it that it really wasn't uh, like per mile, it wasn't that dangerous. Yeah. But just, I mean, honestly, just like today, when it comes to flying planes or cars, mm -hmm. it's in general not that dangerous per mile. However, I mean, accidents do happen. Accidents are going to happen. Yeah, yeah. When you've got yeah, I mean, planes flying thousands of miles or cars traveling how it works. thousands. No, circuses were traveling across the country all the time by rail, and it's, yeah. it's not a surprise that circuses were involved in railway accidents. Uh, and it's almost a surprise it didn't happen more often because even though rail was, you know, reason, very reasonably safe. I mean, we've talked about plenty of rail disasters on the history. Yeah. Guys, so, you know, I, th I think there were more accidents on rail than people even realize at all today uh, at the time. But uh, but that was really because they were simply being used so very much that even if it's very safe, I mean, you're still going to have accidents. And, and you know, yeah. when you've got a train, it's very heavy. It's going very fast. It's very crowded. There's not seat belts in there. Uh, and no. uh, a lot of times, you know, the the carriages were heated by gas and I mean all sorts of things that can make it worse uh, and so yeah there were some horrible accidents and so it's not it's not a surprise given the nature of rail and the nature of circuses that the two would come together for something yeah. terrible like this uh, uh, this particular accident it's another it's a very it's such a such a gilded age thing to mm -hmm. have the circuses which were one of the premier Mm -hmm. uh, entertainments of the era and traveling by train and then of course just the combinations of those two things um, and I think I think that you know when you give it any thought, it really does seem to kind of become uh, inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, not that not this specific yeah, not this specific uh, accident, I mean, there was, but the, there the, were a lot of the idea about that they why would this accident happen the way that it did. But yeah, that that there would be an accident, and that it would be. I mean, yeah. you know, there was an accident involved. Andy Oakley was you know probably one of the most yeah. famous performers of the era, and, and quite a number of people with the show. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is an inevitability that says, I mean, and we still, t I mean, stars today, people that, you know, big stars today, yeah. they die in accidents and we're shocked. Uh, and, uh, oh, yeah, what was uh, Kobe, Kobe Bryant in the, yeah, the helicopter well, not, not uh, that long ago? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's quite a few. I mean, you know, we've had, uh, 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 Anne Heche recently died in an accident. That's right. And uh, 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 those, uh, it's it's simply because you know you've got a number of people and you've got a percentage that something's going to happen. It's going to catch into the you know that, the famous class too, and and you yeah. know, at this point the most famous people in the nation, the, the you know the most popular performers in the nation, were riding the way they became popular is that they were riding yeah. on rail all the time, and so it's uh, it's not a surprise that this happened. You know, I mean it's it's not a surprise that it's going to happen to somebody, some circus somewhere. Yeah. yeah. 
It's kind of amazing to think of, you know, like a clown being one of the most famous. Yeah. Uh, these days, I don't think we think of clowns as, you know, high, high up <laughs> on the entertainment. It, it, I, I don't think there's any clown who you would say is an A-list star. There are A-listers <laughs> you might call clowns, but <laughs> <laughs> not the not the other way around. Um, but I mean, we still, it, it's we still of... have car accidents, we still have plane yeah. accidents, and we still have people that we know that are famous riding on planes and trains and cars and yeah, so this, yeah, is, this is just an example of that. But, I mean, this would have so many of them stocked at one time on yeah. something where if something goes wrong yeah. with the train, you know, it's largely, it's usually a massive disaster, you know. Yeah. And like the last one, there's some chance to it. Oh, it yeah. sounds Absolutely. like when they came to this, they did their best. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, they had they had lights on, they had people trying to warn, to watch for trains, uh, and it just, it was it was a tragedy that the 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 conductor on the other train just, fell asleep and that's the i mean gosh that happens a lot it's at gonna the happen. wheels of cars yeah. these days yeah it's, it's gonna happen and so yeah the, i mean the, the the circus hadn't done anything wrong i mean they were following they were following the rules but i mean you're you're sitting on track and and yeah and i can get the train i mean yeah um it always i mean as you go through the whole thing you're like you know, you feel like you're this close to being able to stop that and then and then it never made the history guy and and yeah. it didn't it you know and sometimes I I love to tell the stories where it looks like the whole thing's going to wreck and at the last moment it's saved. But there's, there's yeah. a lot more stories where it's not and, and they deserve to be remembered. Yeah, we certainly have told some stories of things where there were very serious problems and there was some, some heroic effort that managed to keep, prevent them yeah. from being tragedies. But uh, this this one ended up going the other way and it's it's it happens a lot with both of them. And I think there are good stories to tell for both. This one yeah. is uh, particularly tragic because so, I mean, some of them were very famous people. And I think about that. I mean, I think about the the, the, the day the music died, you know, the, where several, you know, kind of up and coming mm -hmm. and famous musicians died, that this, this would have been something kind of similar in mm -hmm. that there were some big name people who, who died mm -hmm. on this train. Uh, but then the other thing is, you know, there were also these other people. Mm -hmm. And it's tragic that we... We don't even know some of their names. Yeah, some of them. Yeah, a lot of, of the people was... that travel with circuses, uh, you have no idea what yeah. their name was. It was itinerant work, uh, and so they, you yeah. know, who knows? You know, your your brother went off, you know, to seek work, and you have no idea that he was roughhousing for the circus, roundhousing or whatever. He was working for the circus, right? Uh, and, yeah, and, uh, then, rough, and, and 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 died in this train wreck. Yeah, it's it's a terrible, no it's idea. A terrible story. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting kind of it's it's a different kind of world these days. You know, we're so we're so connected, and, uh, but we still occasionally. I mean, there are people who die who we don't know who they are, uh, but it's yeah, a lot less. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot less than it used to be. It. Yeah, it's it's a tragedy that some of these people people went unidentified, and I mean, essentially, the the records aren't even there for you to really figure out if you know this person that went missing was. One of those people would be yeah, fairly difficult they, to prove. So that, now they're but... in an unmarked grave next to a, a statue of an elephant in Chicago. Yeah, and you know, you don't even know. It's it's not even. I mean, we've had some. Well, like Quentin's Hill, where you know you, you can't identify specific bodies, but you know that your uncle died in that train wreck. Yeah. But this is one of those where you don't, you don't, you really don't know who's 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 under those markers. Yeah, they had. I mean, you were, you were mentioning in the video, you know, some of these names were were just their their trade names yeah. whatever they were called as a you know as a clown or yeah. as a as a performer and that's uh, that's that's it's tragic because that was there that you know there's a whole person in a the life there that we we don't get to know it's it's truly yeah. you know forgotten and history you, you re realize that irony when your catchphrase is they deserve to be remembered you remember yeah. you realize the irony when we don't even know when they can't be and there's very little we can do about it yeah. uh, and that's i mean it happens a lot too. You know, there are things that we can't talk about the truly forgotten history because, of course, it's forgotten. Yeah, it's There's forgot no record. It's actually or... forgotten history that we wouldn't know about it. Yeah, but I mean, uh, this is, some people this, point this out. This is on the list, like like many of them, of stuff that's yeah. largely forgotten and 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 that uh, that we can bring some attention to so that people yeah. remember. Yeah, and at the very least, you know, we can remember this, what it was like at this time and the tragedies mm -hmm. and the these people who were working just to make a living, mm -hmm. doing stuff that was really quite normal work yeah. for the time. It was not something out of the ordinary and still came with its own dangers. Yeah, you know, trains facilitated circuses and circuses helped to facilitate trains and the two of them together facilitated a train accident, a, a terrible one. Yeah. Thank you for listening to this episode of the History Guy podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Forgotten History and if you did, you can find more on our website, thehistoryguy.com. 
we release podcasts every two weeks, so stick around if you want to hear more podcasts of Forgotten History. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. You can even get a personalized message from the History Guy himself on Cameo.